Today on Making the Argument, we have special guest Sean Parnell. We're going to be going behind the scenes where we share some war stories from Iraq and Afghanistan. On Making the Argument, we're going to be talking about national defense with the Trump administration. And then finally, we're going to be talking about some things that make America great. All coming up next. One thing I've learned is this, in politics and in combat, cowardice is contagious, but so is courage. And if you're willing to be the first person over those ramparts, you will be shocked at how many people will come with you. I'm asking you to come with me. I'm asking you to be a part of the generation that will restore the promise of this country and breathe new life into it. All right, so with us today, we have Sean Parnell. Uh, you know, author of Outlaw Platoon, just an incredible, uh, incredible stories from Afghanistan, the experience that him and his platoon had, uh, served as an infantry officer in the 10th Mountain Division, which is outstanding. Just the history of the 10th Mountain is incredible. And when you read Outlaw Platoon and you read about what these guys did uh, in, in the War on Terror, they have just added to that legacy and, and that great history of that, that, uh, that unit. So, Sean, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here. So, hey, I'd, I'd like to go over, I mean, obviously, you've, you've written a lot about uh, your experiences over there. Uh, you know, give us, give us a, um, you know, we always like to give people an, an idea of the different experiences the guys on the ground had over. And, and this is something I always talk to veterans about is sometimes veterans don't like to share the war stories. And I always mm -hmm. say, look, you, you got to, because if the only thing they understand about a particular war or conflict is what they read in a history book that was written by someone that was never there, they really don't get the full understanding of, of kind of the humanity of, of what goes on in, in conflict, in combat uh, between people. And so here's what I ask you to do. Give us a, uh, give us, give us a, a, a good story and give us a, give us a funny story. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to start off. I got to tell a, a funny story from Iraq. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what it was like for you guys in Afghanistan, but in Iraq, we were stationed up in uh, northern Iraq at one point. And you, you know the deal. It's hot. It's dusty. And we got, this, we got this little shipment of ice cream. And we treasured these things, man. I mean, that was gold. That was currency, these, these little ice cream bars. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all sitting one day. You know, I think it was uh, July. So it's, it's about 130 degrees in the shade in Iraq. And we're all sitting on the porch. And my buddy Glenn comes out. And he was the, he was the 18 Echoes, the combo guy on our, on our ODA and he walks out, and, and Glenn is not just eating this ice cream. <laughs> Glenn is making love to this ice cream, right? I mean, he's like slowly undoing And he knows it's the last one. So he is slowly undoing the wrapping, and he's just looking at us. And he's just like, oh, this is going to be so good. And we're sitting like, what a punk, yeah. right? And Glenn can't see it, but behind him, here comes Kenny. And Kenny comes out the gate, and he's doing this. He's like, He's doing this right behind Glenn. Glenn can't see him. We're like, what in the heck is Kenny doing? And right as Glenn gets the wrapping down and he's about to eat it, Kenny comes swooping around and goes, Caw -caw! and like literally in one bite gets half this ice cream. And Glenn is sitting there. And I think it's the saddest I've ever seen him, right? He looked like somebody just kicked his puppy. Um, but it was, you know, it's one of those moments with, with all the stress, uh, you know, all the heat, the, you know, the violence of what's going on. You, you get those little punctuated moments in time where you're just kind of sitting there on the deck and you forget for a minute you're at war. And something like that happens that you know, it just sticks with you. And, and both those guys were just great operators. But so there, there's my there's my funny story from Iraq. You know, I'm, I'm sure you guys had, you know, probably different experiences. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Give, give us one. Give us one. Well, so so I was a, a brand new second lieutenant. Right. When I took over, when I I in processed my battalion, I was lucky enough to come out of Ranger School uh, and mm -hmm. take a platoon and went down to Bravo Company 287. I was a brand new second lieutenant, did everything I could to sort of uh, be the leader that my men needed me to be. Um, and, you know, you're told things in training all the time, Nick, you know how it goes. Like, you know, there's a caricature of like an infantry officer that you try to, you know, embody, right? Like you're, yeah. you're big, you're strong, you're tough. Like you can hang with the men, you can run with them. You don't fall out of runs. In fact, you're leading the way. So we get to Afghanistan and, you know, I'm tested as a, as a leader really for the first time. Right. And I've got all mm -hmm. of, you know, got my IBA on, right. My body armor on, like, you know, what, 90 pounds of gear, like all my ammo, my flick, my rifle and everything. And we're going to meet with the vill village elders um, at, at, you know, like a meeting. We are everyone in Afghanistan sits in a circle. Um, and yeah. this is my first impression meeting these people. And 
we had just switched prior to our deployment from uh, the battle dress uniform, like the greens, the green camo to the ACUs. And the yeah. ACUs were, I mean, we, we complained about them incessantly. They were a subpar uniform in a lot of different ways, especially mm -hmm. with, with, you know, the camo pattern going to Afghanistan. It didn't really work <laughs> as well as we yeah. wanted it to. Uh, but, but they ripped constantly, right? Like you take a knee uh, and your, your pants would rip. I mean, almost a hundred percent of the time. So I've got the ACUs on. I, I'm barely able to walk around because I mean, I'm wearing, I've never been to combat before. So all the gear is, is cumbersome. I'm not able to really, you're not able to move as much as you want to with that, with all this stuff on. And, you know, you're sitting down at these meetings and you sit down Indian style with your, you know, you sit down Indian style or, uh, and uh, around the circle talking to these village elders. And again, I'm trying to project strength and toughness. Yeah. I'm a 20, I'm a, I'm 24 years old, but uh, basically I'm an American ambassador with a gun to those village elders in, in Afghanistan. Yeah. And I sit down at this meeting with my two senior NCOs to my left and my right, my second uh, Phil Baldwin who's a squad leader and, and, and uh, Sergeant Wheat, who's a, who's a squad leader. And my crotch blows out in my pants <laughs> in my first meeting in front of all of my key leaders and in front of every leader in, in Afghanistan in, in the district. And it was, I mean, that was, that was, that was their first impression of me is the crotch yeah. blown out of my pants. Well, I'm sitting like, you know, with, with Indian style, what they, <laughs> my kids call it crisscross applesauce now, but you know, yeah. um, but that was the, I mean, the exact, opposite of the kind of first impression that I wanted to, that I wanted to make as, there, as a young leader. And those are the scenes that never make it into like, you know, zero dark 30 or 12 strong, right? They're never going to have the crotch blown out scene while talking to the tribal elder. I mean, and they're all, that's, you know, you, you want, again, you want to be the kind of leader that embodies strength. You're tough, you know, somebody that can inspire your men in the darkest of times. Yeah. And then something like that happens, you're like, well, yeah. that's not really what I wanted to happen. You know, but you, yeah. just, you just roll with the punches, you know, it's, it's sort of yeah. I think it's those humanizing moments between soldiers and officers. And it happens going back, going both ways. But that's the kind mm -hmm. of stuff that really deepens the bond that you have with your brothers on the battlefield. And I say brothers at the time, there were no women in the infantry back in 2006. Yeah. So it was just that's why I say brothers. But, um, yeah, those are the moments that, that you look back on fondly. And those I mean. Got, you have lots of terrible memories of, of war and combat, and especially yeah. when we were there for 485 days, Nick. So we had lots of yeah, really bad incredible. times, but we had good times too, and that was one of them. Yeah, and that's and that's something you know. It, it, it's interesting because every once in a while, someone will ask me, you know, someone that was never in the military or never been to war or whatnot, they'll ask me what it was like, and I always say, like, look, you know, even in the war on terror, I like, I'm I'm glad. I I think our 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 SFA team went over there, our ODA, we went over there, we did our job, we did a good job. But, um, you know, you talk to other guys and certainly your experience on the border with Pakistan, I mean, that was intense yeah. combat pretty much consistently where in, in, in my experience in Iraq, now the guys that were in Mosul in 04, um, you know, they had, I mean, a, a much more intense experience. I mean, we, we went on a lot of combat raids and whatnot, but, um, you know, again, it just differs in level of intensity based off of where you are, what time, what's going on in that moment. But, um, you know, kind of one, one of the things I do remember from Iraq and, and trying to explain to somebody when someone will ask you, um, you know, and my, my wife actually did a great job of explaining this at, at one point because she would notice that when I was deployed, people would come up to her and two types of people would come up to her in the store when they saw like my son or one of my daughters wearing a shirt with, you know, you know, I love my daddy and I have a green <laughs> yeah. beret on or whatnot. Some people will come up and say, hey, you know, thank you and thank you, your family, for your service. We really appreciate it. And, you know, Tina always was very grateful for that. And then other people would come up and they had this attitude of, um, you know, oh, gosh, we're so sorry he has to be over there. Yes. Oh, and, my and gosh. We're so That's sorry so for you guys. Yep. And Tina would just be like, you know, don't pity us. Right. We're not we're not victims. Mm -hmm. And and that was that's one thing that's been kind of frustrating in the political dynamic dynamic to watch is to watch a lot of our, our veterans get treated like victims. And it's something I always oh. kind of remind people, like, don't you ever treat oh. you treat our service members like they were they're defenders of the republic. They're not they're not victims. Nick, you're going to get me on a soapbox here. This drives me crazy. I mean, and I, I this is my first time ever running for political office, but. You know, yeah. I've been a public figure with my books for a long time, and I'll speak at political events and have been in, in the fight here at home for a long time. Um, but, you know, when I when I hear when I meet 
politicians, and, and this is Democrats and Republicans, sometimes, yeah. uh, like you get the, oh my gosh, like, oh, you were there. Oh, like, hey, listen, I volunteered for this. I, I yeah. wanted to be there. If given yeah. the choice, even knowing all the terrible things that we went through and all, and all that we lost in Afghanistan, it was worth it. I'd go back and do it again and volunteer. Don't treat me mm. like I'm some victim of the war. I volunteered for it and I'm proud of my service. Yeah. And this is something that bothers me, Nick. Like if you look at all, even the war memorials, this is an idea that's promulgated through our culture that somehow mm. when veterans come back, we are broken by our experience. Just look at yeah. look at war memorials where you know guys are like, uh, uh, and I look at some of these memorials and I'm like, my God, like, you know, get up, take a knee, drink water. You still got a mission, you know, when you come. Yeah. Home. And well, and, and no, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And I, I tried to explain to somebody once, like, what I said. Look, I don't like being away from my my wife and kids. Right. I love my wife. I love my kids. But if you're asking me, did I want to be over there when we were fighting? Yeah, I, I want to be. I wanted to be with my team. The, the proudest thing in my professional career, the proudest thing, my, no matter what else I do in life, the proudest moment of my professional career will have been in combat with my ODA, with yeah. you know, some of the best yeah. friends I'll ever have. Same. And I was trying to relay this experience, and this is actually a great representation too of how the press manipulates what goes on over there. But we were doing split team operations, so it, it's me and five other Green Berets. So half of our ODA is what. Well. Um, and then we had about 25 Iraqi Shia regular army, and we have 25 Sunni militia, right? So it, it's a pretty, it's kind of a hodgepodge. And it was one of those things too, where we walk out of the uh, the JSOC that we're at, the the you know the or excuse me, not JSOC, the um, uh, the Joint Command Center that they had between the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army. And the Iraqi army guys say, hey, well, look, we want to invite the Sunni militia to come with us because we need to be doing these things together. And we're like, yes, correct answer. That's great. <laughs> so we walk out, and I kid you not, man, there is a little car there, a little like four-door sedan. They have probably got nine people crammed into this thing, and it is like <laughs> flip-flops and PKMs like out the side. And I'm looking over my buddy going, would anybody believe that this is about how, <laughs> how we're about to go on an operation? So we, we go in there and we, we roll up this one, you know, uh, you know, terrorist that had been a lieutenant for this other guy who was the number six target in Iraq. We roll him up. And then, you know, our guy, our Iraqis say, look, we want to check the house next door. We know it's a bed down spot for this, this guy. And we want to, I'm like, hey, that's great. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So I'm, I'm there and I'm co-located with the Iraqi major. We got the, you know, the guys going into the perimeter. All of a sudden, grenade goes off, gunfire. Two of our Iraqis are down. You know, we come running out of the house, secure the perimeter. And, you know, in, in Iraq, especially along the Tigris, because this was right on the Tigris River, I always describe Iraq where we were at as like, imagine Nevada until you get right up to the river and then it's like Vietnam, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Florida Everglades, right? But, so I see this little, I see this little path leading into this grass, and and we're trying to find where this guy is because we've secured all the buildings. We've got Apaches running up and down the Tigris, so we know he hasn't escaped across the water. Nowhere in the perimeter, we we good strong perimeter. So I go down, and I see this little path, and I'm like, all right. So I I let my guys know, um, and and by the way, it was one of those incredible moments where everything hits the fan, and. You watch every guy that you train with do exactly what they're supposed yes. to do. They're grabbing yeah. guys. They're getting them online. They're clearing rooms. They're doing everything. No instruction, no anything, just doing it. Um, and I always try to tell people, like, if there had been a recruiter at that moment, I would have reenlisted for life because it was there was <laughs> nothing like – yeah. So we go down, we end up finding this guy and, and I, I'll never forget, you know, most, a lot of situations where you're kicking in a door or, you know, you're, you're shoot moving and communicating, it's really quick and, and you're reacting based off of your training, based off of instinct or whatnot. I had this one moment where I see this, I get to this point where I can see the little hidey hole or the entryway to the hidey hole and there is no good way to go into this thing, right? So I hand off my M4 uh, to, to my guy with me and I grab my flashbang and my M9 and I'm like, is there any better way to do this? Because this just feels wrong, right? And I, I can re vividly remember in that moment, my dad telling me, he goes, because my dad was LAPD, he was a homicide detective. Um, and he had been in some really you know dangerous situations. And I'd always ask him like, oh my gosh, dad, what did you do? And his response would be, Nick, we're the ones they call when something goes wrong. Yeah. And I vividly remember that moment, like, there's no safe way to do this. We just got to do it. So flashbang, went in the hole, it ends up the guy, the guy had been shot. But uh, we roll him over, number six target in Iraq. <laughs> That's and, amazing. 
we, we put the guy in the Humvee and we drive back into the village. And what was amazing is the Iraqis had already got on their cell phones and called the village because this guy had terrorized these people for five years. I mean, just terrorized, murdered the tribal leader's son, had put, um, had put suicide, had put S vest on children and women and run them into the crowded markets and detonated them. That's one thing that people don't understand is that they, they always talk about what they did to us. It's what they were also doing to their own people. Yeah. And when we came in, the streets were flooded with people celebrating that we had finally brought an people, end to this era. Yeah, people don't get that. People don't understand no. here the depravity of the enemy and just how they yeah. use women and children uh, to exact their their vengeance and attacks on Americans. It's really, they're evil. I mean, there's no other way to yeah. say it. You, you talked about, you know, the proudest moment of your professional life is being there with your ODA and, and watching them all do exactly what they were trained to do. I had a moment that was so similar to that. Yeah. And it was the first time that we were ever shot at. And it's important to remember, like for me, you know, I was just, I mean, I had, I had a little, I had a little bit more training than my troops in terms of Ranger school, airborne school, and some of the other sexy army schools that they put young officers through. But the, tr yeah. the truth is, is I still didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was a young leader go in there with big eyes, big ears, humble, self-effacing, just trying to learn as much as I possibly could from my NCOs, but also my soldiers. And we get to combat for the first time. And I'm telling you, man, we were just we didn't really know what we were getting into. The eyes of the nation were sort of fixated on the Iraq war at the time, because this was when the debate over the surge was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. should we send more troops to a war in Iraq that we may or may not be winning? And the media was all over George W. Bush for that decision. And so we were sort of left to our own devices. We didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into, man. And we were thrown into the hornet's nest and fighting just a global jihadist all star team, Nick. And. There was one particular moment where we're out on a joint patrol with the Afghan National Army. They had five trucks, like Hilux pickup trucks in front of me, and I had yeah. five gun trucks. And we were just supposed to go out and do a humanitarian aid distribution. Um, and, you know, we drive around like we're in this mountainous border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's sort of like a no man's land. We drive around. We sort of drive around this big, huge mountaintop to our left. Right. And it's just straight up sheer. And we drive around it. We drive down into this gravy boat. And just as we hit the bottom portion uh, of that depression that we drove into, we got ambushed from both sides. And it was a Jeez. it was a complex ambush. Right. And an L-shaped ambush. And of course, the ANA, they get ambushed. It's like, you know, you hit a hornet's nest with a baseball bat. They're boom, they're yeah. gone. They're running everywhere. Yeah. And they were essentially yeah. so. So what does that mean? It means that we couldn't really push through the kill zone to, to get to the high ground to establish fire superiority. Had three machine yeah. guns on either side, like sheer cliff face on the left, a sheer drop off on the right. Like I, I couldn't open my door without it just with, without just falling off the side of some cliff into a wadi system that ran about two or three kilometers up to a ridge line Jeez. where there were other. So we couldn't back out. Right. Because we were going around a 90 degree turn around a mountain. So they had ambushed us in the perfect spot, had no line of sight communications with my base. So I couldn't call for fire. It was just one of those moments that was like. What do you do? It's like, you know, you're yeah. in ranger school and the RI is like, what do you do, ranger? What do you do, ranger? Yeah. Looking at my driver, <laughs> he's like, sir, what do you do? I've got my weapon squad leader in the back. His truck just got hit by an RPG. Um, and, you know, what do you – there's nothing in the FM7-8 that gets you out of that situation, yeah. right? Like the TTP of getting, a, you know, a near ambush is assault through it, right? Well, you couldn't. Yeah. You can't assault up a cliff or down into a wadi system. Um, yeah. So I did, you know, the, the life lesson there is just to learn to think outside the box. You have to. And um, you got out of the truck and just started running to the top of the hill to try to consolidate and reorganize the Afghan National Army um, and try to rally my troops so that we can get dismounted and get to the high ground to establish fire superiority and take the fight to the enemy. And I, I mean, honestly, I've never been more scared in my whole life. I got out of that truck. I mean, the rate of fire that the enemy was pouring on us was just unbelievable. They were they had dragging off sniper rifles too. You could hear that cracking over the PKMs that they were that they were using. Yeah. And I'm scared, man. I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, like I didn't tell my men the plan. I just sort of got out, you know, and and hoped that they would follow me. And I'm about halfway up the hill, and I look at at, at my lead truck. It's in like this ball of flame because they got hit with two or three RPGs, and. I just sort of look at my TC, who's one of my squad leaders, uh, second squad leader, and I sort of give him the rally. And I'm halfway up the hill. You know, my lungs are on fire. It's like you're in Afghanistan and in the mountains, you're operating at like 14,000 feet. So my lungs are on fire. It feels like I'm, I'm, I'm about to quit, honestly. And I turn around 
and I see my soldiers had gotten out of the trucks and followed me as well, you know? And at that moment, it was like the shot, like the shot of adrenaline that I got, you know, like, it was like you, like I would have, I would have signed on the dotted line to serve an entire career <laughs> at that moment, you know, to see my men follow yeah. me. And like, you know, we ended up getting fire superiority and consolidating the ANA and taking the fight to the enemy. And I think we killed six or seven of those, of, of those bad guys that, that ambushed us that day. But that was the moment for me, like as a young leader where I, that, that was probably one of the most proud that I've ever been in terms from a yeah. professional standpoint, you know, my, you know, and, and that was really the moment that I think I, I earned the the real respect of, of my troops, you know, and like yeah. as a young leader in garrison, like, you know, you do all you can to shield them from garrison nonsense and, and make sure that <laughs> yeah. they can focus on training. But at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road, they want to know that you can lead them when bullets are cracking by your head and life and death is on the line. And and that moment for me is what sticks out for, uh, uh, sticks out as probably the proudest professional moment for me of my of my whole life. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, you're right about, I, I remember when we were, when I was in ranger school and we were talking <laughs> about laying in ambush lines, it's like, you, you guys want to know what another term for ambush is premeditated murder. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. because, and you look at someone and that was always the most devastating, right? You get in a fully executed L shape ambush. I mean, it is, I mean, you're gone. And, and the fact that, you know, you, your guys stood up, fought through it, were be able to bring order to some of that chaos that's the part where I think when, you know, when we talk about these things with other people that don't have similar experiences, they think that we're talking about enjoying war or enjoying, you know, I had somebody criticize me because, oh, he bragged about the fact that they killed some guy in Iraq. Like, no, I'm bragging about the fact that the guy that was terrorizing this community is no longer doing so anymore. Yeah. And it's not that we, it's not that we love war or combat, but when you have people that you have trained with, and that's the other thing, it's not just... These aren't just work buddies, right? These are people that you you build really close bonds with, and then you get into a, a high intensity situation where you've got to depend on one another, and you go through some of the most difficult circumstances a person possibly can in their life, and every single one of the guys that you depended on and trusted are right there for you, and you're there for them. That's it's, that's the right. part I miss it's, at times. It's one. It's one for me, you know. And I think you hit the nail on the head, Nick. It's one triumph of the human spirit after the next. I had kids in my platoon with me whose job before they were carrying a machine gun in Afghanistan was high school shortstop. And I yeah. saw those young kids do some of the most extraordinary things, not just for the members of my platoon, but for the Afghan people. You know, we built wells and villages. We taught little girls how to read. And, and, mm -hmm. and to be clear, Nick. And you, and I know you know this, but for everybody else that might be watching this, it's not like we're bragging that we killed the bad guys. We're pr I'm proud of the stuff that we did in Afghanistan. We took 350 enemy fighters off of this earth. And you know what? The world is a better place because of it. And you know mm -hmm. why? Because if they had their way, our way of life would be gone forever. If they could snap mm -hmm. their fingers and, and take and, and do away with our way of life, they would. And so, of course, I'm proud of my service, and of course, I'm proud to have served with my men and watched them do incredible things on the battlefield. But you know what? Like what combat teaches you is that life truly is a privilege. Being an American and being free uh, is a privilege, and recognizing that this country really is exceptional. Because many of the places that we go, Nick, people don't have what they what we have here. You know, yeah. and a lot of the Afghans that, that we talk to, they want what we have here, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't have it. So it gives you a deep appreciation for what we have here as a country. It also gives you a deep appreciation of the enemies that we face in the world and the fact that there is evil in the world and these people would kill us if they had the chance. So I say all that to say the world is a much better and safer place without them, because not only would they kill us, they they they. They prey on the Afghan people yeah. and the Iraqi people as well. Like the world is a better place without them. Yeah. Well, hey, look, and that, that's a that's a good segue going into our, our next segment where we're talking about national security policy because you know I, I agree in the sense that I think when we look at we can all have disagreements on you know U.S. foreign policy, Iraq, Afghanistan, right. whatever we yeah. want. But I always caveat with saying you know our men and women in uniform got a lot to be proud of. I can't always say the same thing about our politicians, and that's what we're going to be talking about <laughs> next, coming up with making the argument on national defense policy. Mm -hmm. 
All right, now on Making the Argument, we're going to be talking a little bit about U.S. national security policy. So as you have two guys here that have both served in combat, you know, Sean has had an incredible uh, experience, and, and you heard some of the, the, you know, just the experiences that he had with what he endured, with what his troops endured, and how they overcame it. Um, and I think it's given both of us a unique perspective on how we look at national security policy, because there's, I think there's kind of this impression that if you were in the military, you're automatically like what they call a hawk. <laughs> and my, my thing has always been like, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Like, if, if you mean, do I think, am I a pacifist? No, not even close. If the United States is tagged, do I think we should hit back? Oh, yeah, we should hit back and hit back hard. Uh, but I don't think we're the world's police force. Like, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, I, I, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I'm not a hawk. In fact, and, and you, and I would say that you aren't either, right? Mm -hmm. Um Nobody understands the cost of war more and the horrible fallout that can that can follow if, you know, than, than guys like us. People who have seen the horrors of war understand it better than anybody else. So I, I would say that we are more cautious to get the, mm -hmm. you know, with regards to our, our foreign policy and what it means to send men and women of this country, which, by the way, is our most precious natural resource. They mm -hmm. send men and women uh, to go fight for this country. I mean, I. I that's an unbelievable responsibility, and it's one that I think yeah. you and I really understand. Um, well, all that all that said is that I recognize. I also recognize that some things are worth fighting for. If we get mm -hmm. hit, do we hit back? Absolutely, we we should hit back. You know, and and you know, I think for for most of America, it's important that they understand that. You know, the U.S. military, we're not a conquering force. I, I think we're the greatest liberating force the world has ever known. I mean, we have the most lethal warriors also that the world has ever known, but our mission is to liberate and to free uh, and to free the oppressed, which is your, which is Green Beret's literal mission. Yeah, that's our, but, that's our motto. <laughs> your motto, and I, I didn't even plan that, but the truth yeah. is that that really is at the core of everything we do. We're the greatest military force, liberating force the world has ever known. Um, and I, I sort of see, you know, just from a general philosophical standpoint, Nick, Peace through strength is mm -hmm. is where I'm at when it comes to foreign policy. You know, walk yeah. softly and carry a big stick. Um, and when you look at, you know, I I, I don't like the idea of, of being the world's police. You know, and mm -hmm. you talked we talked a little bit about Afghanistan. We've been at war there for almost two decades. And I think if you asked, you know, an average American private, hey, what's the mission? I think you'd probably get a different answer from every one of them. Yeah. And and, and you know. You know this, Nick, but that's a problem. You know, if, oh, the, yeah. if the mission is so diluted that everybody gives a different answer, then maybe we should try to define what the end state in Afghanistan should be. And, and it, it, at, the, at the end of the day, the Afghans at some point are going to have to pick up and fight for their own country for sure. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and, and in, to your point, it's, it's not the, it's not the privates. And I was, I started out as an infantry private, right? It's not the <laughs> private's job to under, it's not the private's job to come up with the strategic, you know, in state for all of this. That's why it, it's amazing to me. And you, you see this happen. You've seen it happen in other wars in U S military history, where all of a sudden the larger objective is lost or yes. the larger strategy yes. is lost. Yes. But then, and then you look at the metrics we start keeping and the metrics ends up becoming about how many high value targets did we take down or how many battles were we in or how many battles did we win or what. And, and look, if, if you're going to keep that metric, I know we can win those metrics. Why? Because I have full faith and confidence in the American you know, fighting yeah. men and women. You go tell that platoon leader, you go tell that you know, squad leader, that platoon sergeant, that rifleman, hey, go take that hill. They're going to take the hill. Right. The question is, is why did they have to take the hill? And that's a question that has to be answered, you know, at your more strategic levels in the military. But then the broader question of why are we there and what does victory look like? Absolutely. Yep. My biggest problem is this. I think that for too long in this country, and I think it really started in, in the I mean, you could argue it started somewhat in the 50s, but especially in the 60s and onward. I think Congress is completely engage in a dereliction of duty with respect to foreign policy. Yes, it is the job of the executive branch to execute the wars. But when it comes to declaring war, that is a function of Congress. And Congress repeatedly now has decided that, well, we're not going to declare war, but we'll fund the combat operations. And what it does is it gives these, con it gives these people in the House of Representatives and the Senate the ability that when, when things are going well, 
they're beating the war drums and they're patting themselves on the back and beating their chest. And inevitably, when things start going bad, they start pointing fingers. And I think it's in part because they didn't actually take the time to debate, do their job and debate the strategy on what are we there to do? What is our end state? What does victory look like? Absolutely. And so agree. I'm I'm furious with these members of Congress that are, are all too happy to, again, authorize the funding to send troops into harm's way, but don't even have, you know, an ounce of courage worth to, to say, hey, we're going to actually vote on this and debate on this in a meaningful way before we commit U.S. men and women you know, to a dangerous I, situation. I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, this speaks, I think this is why we need more veterans in Congress on both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle. You know, yeah. I had Democrats in my platoon. Did I agree with them on, on many issues? No, but you know what? We respected one another uh, enough to have mm -hmm. conversations and, and we respected one another enough to sort of meet in the middle um, on most of our discussions. And I think if you get, you, you've got you know, the more veterans that serve, whether you're Democrat or Republican, I do think that bipartisan compromise is more possible. Because if you raise your right hand to serve this country, right, at some point you put, you know, you know, your country before your family, your country before making a buck, your country before your own life. And and because you've already demonstrated the ability to do that, I think that by the time you get to Capitol Hill, you know, and you're, you're, you're debating these issues, you're more likely to put your country first, you know, and that's just, that's just, you know, maybe that is, maybe that's naive in, in this day and age, but I do believe that those who have seen the horrors of war would be more reticent to send our men and women into war without a robust debate about the conflict itself. And so I, yeah. look, I totally agree with you. And, and, and Nick, this is something that I, I kind of appreciate about President Trump, you know, mm -hmm that he thinks differently about this stuff. Republicans and yeah. Democrats, whether it's George yeah. W. Bush or President Obama, I, I, I think by and large, you know, the, the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the strategies were kind of the same. I think Obama's Middle East strategy was, was disastrous for where we are today, mm -hmm. but I don't even want to get into that. I just like the idea that President Trump, you know, he sees things through a very mission focused lens, like very, yeah. you know, and he's got already got an end state in mind for what he wants. Like, yeah, I'm going to go in, I want to take out this terrorist, uh, in Syria and I want to leave, you know, yeah. I don't yeah. want our, <laughs> I don't want our green berets yeah. trapped in the middle of a Syrian civil war where you don't even know what the enemy is. But if we know, if we know a terrorist is there, let's go get him. Let's take him out and let's leave. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of like that. I like that mission set, if you will, because that means that we're not going to get embroiled into a protracted conflict that would last for 20 years, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think that's well, why the war fighters appreciate him, Nick, because he knows that he's thinking that yeah. we know that he's thinking about those things, you know? No, I, I again, one of the things when, you know, when Trump first ran for office, I was a little bit skeptical. Me too. <laughs> but one, me of too. The, one of the things that he was saying early on, though, that's, that started to intrigue me was that he was a guy that respected our military, respected that we needed to have a strong military and that we needed to act decisively when, when, when he needed to. But he also, he, he didn't seem all that... He didn't seem all that eager to actually get us involved into another long-term war. He didn't have this grand vision of the world where by U.S. military strength and by depleting our own taxpayers and depleting our own service members, we were going to you know, make the world, quote, safe for democracy. It was more of this idea that, no, we're going to protect U.S. interests. You know, when appropriate, you know, we, we will protect our allies. We're not going to put up with anybody threatening us or threatening our interests. But by the same token, it is not our job to create your country in our image. Uh, and, exactly. You know, exactly. I mean, and, look at Afghanistan. I, like yeah. our mission for a long time, Nick, was to create a Jeffersonian democracy in Afghanistan. <laughs> I mean, I, you, and we laugh about that because yeah. we know that that country, most people yeah. in Afghanistan don't even know that they live in a country called Afghanistan. You know, yeah. and so yeah. we see how sort of foolhardy that mission is. Yet we've been in that mm. country for twenty years trying to do it. And oh, so yeah. I, I just appreciate, you know, that that President Trump brings a different perspective, and that's different yeah. than both Republicans and Democrats. Oh. Because I mean, look, look, Nick, we're out there. The U.S. military is out there protecting other countries' borders. But yeah. we're not even protecting our own. Yeah. And so the American people see that and they can think for them. American people are smart. They think for themselves and they say, wait a second. Like, yeah, why are we protecting other people's borders mm -hmm. and not our own? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. 
Oh, yeah. no, and, and I think you're right, too, that this has been a problem that I've seen from both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. I mean, I think the Republican Party has, has been better with respect to understanding the necessity of American military power and strength. I agree, yeah. But, but I've been just as frustrated with, the, with Republican presidents that I thought were too eager to milita- you know, get us engaged militarily uh, when they you know, had some sort of grandiose plan. And uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll appreciate this. So in 2009... Yeah, 2009. So I was just coming out of Iraq. We left in January of uh, 2009 for my second tour over there. And I was the 18 Fox on the on the team. So I was the Intel sergeant. And I would write the Intel sit rep. And at this point, you know the deal when you're when you're transitioning out, right? We weren't doing anything. We had packed everything up. The 10th group ODA was coming in. They were already starting to take over stuff. And so literally all we did for like, you know, the three days before I'm writing the sit rep is, is pack our stuff and hand stuff over to 10th group. And my captain comes in, my detachment commander comes in and goes, hey, Nick, you need to put more on the sit rep. I'm like, sir, literally, there's been like no message traffic. We haven't done any meetings. I mean, you wanted me to make something up? I mean, he goes, just put more, put more on the sit rep. I'm like, all right. So <laughs> Ryan, and I, Ryan and I had a game we played, and he forgot to play it that day. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'd write out my sit rep, and every once in a while, I'd put some sort of smart aleck remark in there or whatnot, and he would read it, laugh, take it out, and then send it up to Special Operations Task Force North. He forgot to do it this time. <laughs> so as I write my sit rep, on the very bottom, I put in this little portion that I, I swear, I thought he was going to read it and take it out. He forgot to. I said, can someone up there in Special Operations Task Force North please explain something to me? Why are we the only military from a federated constitutional republic with a free market economic system that travels to faraway lands, overthrows violent dictatorships, and sets up parliamentary democracies with centrally planned economies? (laughs) (laughs) So this goes up, and like not 45 minutes later... I get a call from from my at that time my uh, battalion commander who's now I think a two star general, <laughs> and uh, it put Freitas on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, sir, <laughs> and, and it was like interesting comments, Nick. Not appropriate for the sit rep. I'm like, sir, I apologize, <laughs> but I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> no, you're not wrong. <laughs> but uh, but no, it, it is one of those things where you know I, again. I'm proud of the work that, that we did on the ground over there. But as I look at issues like Iraq and you you have all these politicians and you have all these academics that have all these, again, grandiose ideas for how another civilization should be carved up and governed. And, you know, again, to your point with Trump, when he sees a threat, he sees the U.S. military's job as, OK, we need to defeat this threat or mitigate this threat. And we need to create an environment where you know, U.S. forces, our allies, our interests are going to be more secure. But it's not our job to, again, recreate your society and our image. You need to find a solution that works for your society, your culture, your geography. And I, what's amazing about that is that I actually think that's far more respectful I agree of completely. other cultures. I agree. Look, and, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. And, and Trump, again, president's instincts on things are often correct. I like mm-hmm. Right. Very much how he brings yeah. in battlefield leaders from non-commissioned officers or lieutenants to talk about yeah. the strategy. Why? Because the reporting system is inherently it's, it's based inherently on a meritocracy. Right. Yeah. So no battalion commander or brigade commander who's in charge of an area operation wants to say, oh, my God, my A.O. is a mess. Like we're not accomplishing yeah. the mission like we, we yeah. can't do. No, that never happens. And so, yeah. and I'm not saying that our battalion commanders or brigade commanders aren't being honest. No, I'm just saying that the meritocracy system creates yeah. a structure that breeds, that breeds like, hey, yes, sir, mission accomplished, mission accomplished, mission accomplished. And so, what as that pa- is passed up the chain of command, it, you know, President Trump is maybe looking at a report of the sec depths, looking at a report, and ev- everything across the board is green. There are no problems. As a leader, you mm-hmm. think like, as, especially a guy's who've been there, Nick, like you and I, yeah. it's like, wait, if everything is green, there's a, there's an issue. And so yeah. that's what, that's yeah. why I like the idea that president Trump sort of brings in those battlefield commanders and says, Hey, okay, what's, what's up with this? You know, yeah. uh, what's your yeah. assessment of things? Um, because I do think that the meritocracy system in, in the military breeds can breed overly rosy reporting, you know? Yeah. 
we've we've created an incentive structure within the military to again give the best report possible yes, of the situation yeah, exactly. on the ground. Yeah, can you imagine? And, can you imagine? And, like, I, and I get it, right? You're yes. a commander. You want to command yes. other things, right? You have an incentive to yes. say that. And but yeah, go down and talk. Go down and talk to the the E five fire team exactly. leader if you want. If you want a perfectly honest, expletive filled <laughs> description of exactly. what is going on, that E five will tell you. <laughs> go down and talk um, to any, and you're in combat. Go down and talk to those leaders that, are, and you'll be lucky that something is not on fire when you go. Oh yeah, you know, I mean yeah. that's that's <laughs> that's how some of these operations go. Yeah. But when they get up to a PowerPoint slide at the division and core level, like everything's yeah. perfect, everything's rosy. So no, no, I mean that. And if you look at the reports, the annual reports on Afghanistan that come out in every January, every January, mm -hmm. just go do yourself a favor. Anybody that looks, go Google the last 10 years of those. It's like they basically yeah. cut and pasted every report before. Yeah. There's no change. Yeah. But the fact is oh, you yeah. read the news, you know, things have changed. So, oh yeah. And I think that's yeah. what the president. When you, and you talk to the guys coming home. You talk to the guys coming home and it's, I feel like I, I've got the press on one side where everything's doom and gloom and all U.S. soldiers are war criminals, right? Yes. And then you've got, and then you've got the hierarchy on the other side where everything's just going swimmingly commander, right? When it's like, okay, no, we need a little bit of objective analysis on this. And, you know, one of the things that, again, I see my responsibility, and, and like you said, you know, the motto of special forces is to liberate the oppressed. The other term that's always used is quiet professionals. Yeah. And I was joking with one of my buddies now, and I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not in SF anymore, which means I don't got to be quiet or professional, right? I can, <laughs> I can actually, because uh, quite frankly, I'm tired of our guys having to go out there and, and you know, carry out either impossible or ill-conceived missions because politicians don't understand. And I feel like, you know, and you've, you've carried this torch incredibly, but it's this idea like, no, okay, I was there. I'm not there anymore, but my buddies still are. A lot of them are. And they can't, they can't get up and talk about what, but right. I sure as hell can. That's and I'm exact, going to, and I, and I see it as a responsibility. Oh, Nick, you talked about this. It was the first thing you talked about is about the importance of veterans coming home and talking about their story. Mm -hmm. Look, only 0.4% of this nation has served our country during the longest period of war in our nation's history. Now, a couple things about that. When men come home, men and women come home, because, because so few of us have served, you can come home and feel like an exile in your own country. Mm -hmm. Like people don't truly understand what you went through. That can lead to isolation, and that isolation can lead to, God forbid, things like substance abuse uh, and, and suicide, right? I think so part of that reason is, what I just described is part of the re part of the reason why our suicide rate among the veteran community is so high. You come home, you feel like an exile in your own country. On the flip side of that coin, when when veterans don't talk about their experience, Americans that don't go to war don't understand yeah. what it means to be free. And then therefore, yeah. they elect representatives that don't really understand what it means to be free or what it means to send people to war to defend freedom. So I yeah. say to veterans all the time, yeah, it was your duty to serve, but you also have a duty and obligation to come home and mm -hmm. tell Americans what that was like and help educate our country on what it means mm -hmm. to be free and, and the cost of war. Because by and large, down the line, that means that you know, our populace will be more educated. And because they're more educated, uh, the, the political leaders that we have in Washington will be more educated It's it, you know, because politics is downstream from culture. And yeah. so veterans have a duty and obligation to talk about their story. So I I try to say this all the time because it, I try to say this all the time. It's it's really important to bridge that gap between warrior and civilian, and and the onus is on the veteran to do it, and and that's something that I think we need to do better as a veteran community. No, I agree. I agree. So when we look at like national security threats, like what as you look, and obviously there's a lot of different directions we can go on there, but but what's one or two that you see as being something that hey, we need to start realigning our focus with respect to our national defense strategy toward you know these couple of issues. What, what do you see as kind of emerging think, threats or existing threats? I think the biggest threat of our generation is going to be China. I mean, mm. and you look at what happened with this pandemic uh, and the fact that they concealed uh, the extent to which that they were struggling with the pandemic. And, and I mean, look, man, they, they locked down domestic flights the moment that they knew the virus was out there, but they sent millions of people with the Chinese New Year all over the world to infect other countries. And if you know and you understand Chinese culture, I, I, I don't, that was probably a deliberate decision to make sure that everybody suffered at the same level that they, because they, China knew their economy was going to take an unbelievable hit. 
And if you think about China's goal over the next 100 years, they want to be the lone global superpower. That is what they want. They've said it publicly time and again. And so I don't think for us, I, I think that, they, that it was probably deliberate that they sent people that they knew might or may be infected with a virus all over the world to make sure that the world suffered the same economic fate that China did. Uh, but also, you know, this pandemic, when the dust settles, I think we're going to learn a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, the fact that our supply chain, that we've outsourced much of our supply chain, medical device production, antibiotic production to China, manufacturing, we've got companies like Apple that are manufacturing. I mean, there's so many things wrong with our relationship with China. And and the foundation of, of all of it is the fact that it, you, we've got all these things tied up in China, right, economically. But mm -hmm. China does not <laughs> they're not our friend. Their, yeah. their number one goal in the world is to overtake us. So I think we have to, I really think we have to reassess our relationship with China. They don't have our best interests at heart. They're certainly not an ally. Um, and I think our, our defense department would be wise to realign ourselves to combat that threat. You know, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, counterinsurgency operations are always going to be important. The asymmetric threat that terrorism poses to our country is always going to be something that we have to be ready for. But I think we need to start shifting our focus to a more conventional threat of China. I mean, I, I think that that is going to be the greatest challenge of our generation. No, and I, you know, I think it's interesting with China, too. And, you know, the president said this. Of course, the media always take him out of context. But it's, you know, I have no problem with the Chinese people. I do have a problem with a dictatorial communist yeah, Chinese agree. regime right. that is not only oppressing their own people, but is also targeting us and targeting other countries within the region and the right. world. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one, one of the things that you've got to hand it to the, the Chinese, you know, government is they've always had a very, very long-term strategy. Yes. And- yeah. And that, that long-term strategy and that economic development that they've been experiencing, and, and by the way, for all the socialists watching this that think <laughs> that the reason why the Chinese economy is good is because it's centrally planned, what a load of garbage, right? They have freed their economies extensively ever since Mao, and that's why they've actually started to experience more economic benefit. It's not by adopting communist policies. It was actually by injecting more market uh, reforms. Market -based. Yeah, right. Yeah, but if, but if you look at what they're doing now, and, and this goes back to the asymmetric component because, you know, a lot of time we understand this, but a lot of times people hear asymmetric and they think purely from the standpoint of maybe like the United States military fighting a terrorist organization. Asymmetric just means that one side has a great deal more power in a particular area than another side. And so now they've got to use their resources more effectively and efficiently in order to combat the strengths and the weaknesses of the larger power. And you see China doing that with things like hypersonic weaponry. You oh, see them doing absolutely. it with cyber technology, right? You know, China's China understands that, you know, at, at least right now, their air force is not taking on air, air force, right? Their Correct. ground troops are not taking on our ground troops. Their Navy is not taking on our Navy. Now, they're certainly trying to build their naval dominance right now, uh, but they're, they're, they're still a ways behind us in all those categories. But they have invested a ton of money into things that you get a high payoff for very little investment with respect to their cyber attacks, Absolutely, their corporate yeah. espionage. And so, no, I, I, you know, again, completely agree where when I look at, who is that? You know, terrorism is a threat. Do I believe it's an existential threat? No. But it, it's a threat and it's something that has to be taken seriously. But when you look at something like China, China, I think, has the desire to, again, challenge U.S. economic and military supremacy, which puts it more on that existential level like you saw with the Soviet Union. Yes. And we, we better start we better start paying attention to that because I think I think China learned a lot of lessons from how the USSR operated versus yes. how they've chosen to operate. And, and Nick, you know, look, it's hard to speak to these issues because, you know, like Tom Cotton and I think and, I, mm. and I, Tom Cotton and I called for a ban on travel from China before the president actually did it. But mm. my God, you, you get called xenophobic in this country for doing it. Yeah. No, nothing. There's yeah. nothing xenophobic about trying to protect the interests of the American people and knowing yeah. exactly what the communist regime of China wants to do, what their end state goal is, is, is to overtake America and become the lone superpower over the next hundred years. They're mm -hmm. open and honest about that. And so it's, we, we live in a precarious time because sometimes mm -hmm. it's difficult to speak truth uh, to what's happening yeah. in the world, you know, without being, without being incessantly attacked uh, by by the media or, you know, in this case, Democrats. I mean, if you look at what Joe Biden, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, uh, when the president banned travel from China, Nancy Pelosi put forth in the House floor a no ban act. 
You know, Joe yeah, Biden, yeah. President Trump, xenophobic. Well, that's yeah. President Trump's ban on travel from China is largely looked at now as, say, as, as being responsible for saving hundreds of thousands of lives here in this country, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, again- well, And it was at the same time that Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Bill de Blasio <laughs> were encouraging people to go to street festivals, right? I mean, exactly. the, the exactly. intellectual dishonesty is just amazing to me. Exactly right. And, and, and the press never seems to want to hold them to account. Like, you know, I, I can understand maybe the press not bringing up something where you said something 20 years ago and, you know, you changed your mind 20 years later. But, but when five minutes ago, right, you yeah. were saying that, yeah. the Trump, you know, Trump is xenophobic because he wants to, you know, ban travel from China. And then, you know, again, the next day it's he's not taking this seriously. Wait a second. You you were encouraging people to go out to street festivals, you know, 27 seconds ago. You you don't get to come back now and say that you recognize what the threat was long before the president did. And that's the sort of stuff that if the press was actually doing their job, you know, they would they would be coming in and saying, "All right, look, this is too far." Yeah. But but, but they've mean, already demonstrated nothing's it, too far for them. And and what really bothers me, Nick, and I'll say it again, you know, uh, first of all, I appreciate your point of, of saying, yeah, the, the Chinese, the communist government of China is not the yeah. Chinese people. I mean, the Chinese yeah, people yeah. suffer at the hands of that government more than anybody else, I think. You know, but but the I the, if the press were handling this honestly, they'd be asking this question time and again to the Chinese ambassador. Why did you lock down domestic travel in your country when you knew that there was a highly contagious pathogen on you know, that was set free in your country, but allow millions of Chinese citizens to travel all over the world internationally. Yeah. Why? And I, yeah. I mean, I think that not only does America deserve an answer to that question, but the entire world does. But why aren't, well, we, why aren't I, we asking it? I, I feel like we're not asking that question enough. Well, and I, th I think when we talk about threats, right, I, unfortunately, I feel like a lot of our press sees the Trump administration as a bigger threat to the United States than you know, the communist regime of China. And that's really unfortunate on a number of levels, both practically and philosophically, because even when I have stringent disagreements with colleagues of mine on the other side of the aisle, I don't view them as my enemy. I, agree, right, I, don't view, exactly. I don't view people as my, I may disagree with their philosophy. I might want to debate that philosophy, but you know, unfortunately, that's just not the situation we're living in with a lot of people in the press. But hey, we're going to go ahead and, and move into our third segment here on things that make America great. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Obviously, Sean and I have been a, had an opportunity to share some experiences from war, exper, ex, uh, share some experiences with respect to our perspectives on national security. And uh, both of us have served with people that are lifelong friends, and both of us have lost people that we cared about. On uh, this segment today, though, I want to I honor a particular family, and that's the Park family, and that's uh, Dehan and Sejin. Both of them were adopted from Korea. Both of them ended up deciding to serve the military or join, uh, join the military and serve their country. And both of them became Green Berets. Both of them went to Army Special Operations. And um, I remember getting the call at home uh, when I had a buddy of mine let me know. He goes, Nick, don't say anything yet. Um, they're still waiting to notify the family, but it looks like dehan has been killed in Afghanistan. And um, it, that shook me like I, I can't even tell you because... He was a good friend. Um, he was someone, I remember we used to share parenting tips because we both had small kids. We both had two girls. Um, and he loved to play chess. And he had the driest sense of humor. He was this guy, he was a really funny guy, but dry sense of humor and just an absolute consummate professional. I mean, if I, if I had to go to war, Dehan is one of the guys that I wanted standing by my side there. And I will never forget... Um, members of the ODA that were permitted to come back for the funeral. And at the, at the National Cemetery they had up there close to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, his wife was there, his daughters were there. They were all carrying folded flags representing Dehan. And then they brought over this little shuttle uh, contraption to be able to take his casket from the memorial service area over to his final resting place. And I watched my buddies who were still in the service go over, thank the staff, and said, no, we'll, we'll carry him. And they brought him to that, they brought him to his final resting place. And guys still go back, they still visit. 
Um, I met his brother there. His brother ended up getting killed a couple years later. You want to talk about a family that adopted these two boys and raised them as their own and instilled in them just a love for country and a love for family. And these two guys exemplified that. And if you want to ask me what is one of the things that absolutely makes this country special and incredible and the whole principles of liberty and the idea of each person being able to choose for their own life what they want to do, you look at these two guys that were willing to risk everything, that were willing to trade everything, all of their future, in order to defend something that they believed in. And so when I do hear people treat veterans like they're victims, the reason why I get so angry about it is because my friends weren't victims. They were people that were willing to give up everything so that their children could have the chance to live in the sort of country that they got to grow up in. And I think the obligation that we have, that I know I have, is to make sure that his kids do grow up in a country worthy of his sacrifice. So to Dehan, to his brother Sajin Park, um, I say thank you. I say thank you to their families. They will never be forgotten. My kids will know of them. Yeah, amen, man. Gosh, that's powerful stuff. I, uh, yeah, and I, I agree. I, I sort of, I, I want to talk about my platoon. I was, I was blessed to just really be a small part of that unit. And my infantry platoon was the most wildly diverse group of men that you could possibly imagine. You know, I had Northerners serving next to Southerners, Christians serving next to atheists, you know, six of my men weren't citizens, right. When they joined when they joined the, the army. I mean, a guy from Murmansk, Russia, I had a guy from Haiti, I had a guy from Mexico, I had a guy from South Vietnam, I had, I had people from all over the world. And, and they all joined the military for, for different reasons, but the, but the bedrock of, of why they joined was a, they believed this country was exceptional and they thought it was worth defending. And when we were in Afghanistan for 485 days, almost every single member of my platoon was wounded. In fact, every immigrant that came here uh, and weren't citizens, they were all wounded for this country, too. And, and you know, we lost some good people in Afghanistan over a couple of deployments. Uh, and what's even more tragic, Nick, is we've lost more people since we've been home to suicide than two combat deployments, which is just a tragedy of epic proportions. And, you know, America is hemorrhaging I think, you know, her sons and daughters at, at an alarming rate, you know, which is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the men and women who raise the right hand to serve this country to, you know, that put this country before themselves, I think is our, our, our most precious natural resource. And, you know, I was so blessed to serve in the same trenches as, as those men. And, you know, ultimately, you know, you've seen You've seen Saving Private Ryan, I think, if you haven't, there's a scene at the end where, where Tom Hanks' character says, earn this, you know? Yeah. And when I watched it before I joined the military, I guess I really didn't understand that, but I do now. And the fact that I was able to survive and come home and, and live when so many others didn't is, it bothers me a little bit, you know? But you know, I, every day that I wake up and I draw breath, I think of that, earn this. I, it's my job right now to live a life worthy of the extraordinary sacrifice of, of my men. Those men, my men, some of them didn't get to come home. I did. Mm -hmm. I've got to live a life worthy of their sacrifice every day or I'm not honoring their memory. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I want to honor the men of, uh, men of Outlaw Platoon, really every American that has, has donned the uniform and put this country uh, before yourself, uh, your patriots, our nation is grateful. And, and, I know I speak for both of us, Nick, that we, we are blessed to even have, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. We're blessed to have even yeah. served in the same military as them. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And, and uh, um, I, I was talking to a Vietnam veteran the other day and um, I said, you know, I, I got to tell you something. When I came home from my second tour in Iraq, when we landed at the airport, Vietnam veterans were lined up at the airport to make sure we got the welcome home. Absolutely. That they never received. Yep. And it was, it was really important because I, I, I like you said, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And um, I always make it a point to tell those Vietnam veterans, too. It's like you need to understand something, regardless of what, you know, certain academics or reporters or whatever, whatever they say about you. 
your generation of veterans are the heroes of my generation. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you said that, man, because that you took, that's exactly how I feel too. Every time I see a Vietnam veteran, I tell him, welcome home. Uh, yeah. And ultimately that generation made a promise that America would honor the veterans, our vet, you yeah. know, this country's veterans when we came home from war. And, yeah. you know, I always tell them, you know, not only just welcome home, but, you know, thank you so much for the legacy that we inherited from you because it's a strong yeah. one. And if it wasn't for, for men and women who served during the Vietnam War, I probably wouldn't even put on the uniform. And, yeah. and I'm grateful for them. Yeah. Well, again, that's been our Things That Make America Great segment. Stay tuned. We're going to go ahead and do our outro. And we're going to learn a little bit more about how we can all help Sean be, uh, be a congressman from Pennsylvania. Coming right up. Okay, finally, that is all the time that we have for today. But we got to get out some very, very important information right here because Sean is running for Congress and we desperately need to get him elected. So, Sean, tell us what district you're running in and how people can learn more about you and figure out how to help you and, and make sure that we get you to Washington, D.C. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. I'm running in Western Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania's 17th Congressional District, which has become one of the biggest swing districts in the country, you know? And, you know, the president uh, called me to, to serve in October of 2019. So I turned my private sector life upside down, said, you know what, time to get back in the fight and serve my country again. Um, you know, you can donate uh, to my campaign or contribute or volunteer, or whatever it is that you want to do. We'd be honored to have you. Um, it, it, the website's simple, seanforcongress.co. It's not a .com, it's a .co. seanforcongress.co. You can contribute to the campaign. You can join the movement. You can volunteer, what have you. Um, and look, 2020 election cycle, people say it every single year, but I truly believe uh, that 2020 is the most important election of our lifetime. And, and if look all around you in the midst of this pandemic. You know, again, when the dust settles from this pandemic, it's going to, you know, I think we'll learn a number of things. Uh, but but leadership in a time of crisis is is mm -hmm. just so important and, it, you know, all over the country, but just not here in my district. We, we need to do everything that we can and en endeavor to elect real leaders who put our country first. And, and I believe that I'm one of those people. And, and Nick, I know you are, too. Uh, so, you know, we'd love to have you on board with the campaign. The people of PA 17 deserve a real warrior and a, and a real voice. And that's what I'm trying to do. Well, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I want to thank you for sharing your time, sharing your experiences, sharing your philosophy and your thoughts with us. And I just want to encourage everybody. A lot of time, you get this a lot when you're running for office. And, and I'll tell you what, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're in this because we want to fight. I'm running in the Virginia 7th. He's running to PA 17. We're in this not because it's been a lifelong dream to right. go to Washington, <laughs> D.C. and be in Congress, Right. Exactly. This is an, this is it's another it's another battleground, right? It's another battleground. It's another fight for the things that we believed in, the oath of the Constitution that we swore. And so, just because you don't live in Pennsylvania 17 doesn't mean you shouldn't contribute. Doesn't mean you should help, because the bottom line is is when Sean casts a vote, when I cast a vote, that's going to affect the entire country. And so, looking at these districts like Sean's, where it is a swing district, we have an opportunity to do a pickup right here and replace somebody that wants to impeach the president with somebody that's actually going to work with them to achieve good economic results, good national security results. You know, that's the sort of thing that we need right now. And we need people from all over the country to show up, find these districts like Sean's and be willing to put in the resources to help. You know, we get asked all the time, I guarantee you, we get asked all the time, how are you going to beat Michael Bloomberg's money? Easy with yours, right? It's it's like we don't need a bunch. It's not like we don't need a bunch of billionaires coming in and, and shifting things, but we do need individuals that care about the things that Sean has articulated uh, to step up and do whatever they can in order to help people. So go to Sean's website, follow him on Facebook, follow him on Twitter. You know, if you can contribute, contribute because this is the sort of guy that we want to see in Congress. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining, uh, making the argument with Nick Freitas today. Again, thank you very much to Sean for joining. Us, and we definitely want to have you on again in the future. We should we should do a, a post election uh, episode as well. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to all our viewers. Please consider giving us a five star review. Those five star reviews really help push out the podcast and, and get these this message, these arguments, these experiences out to as many people as possible. And that's the sort of thing we need to do to ultimately not only make the argument but to win it. Again, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Nick.